All right, Hilltown, if you would, please open your Bibles. We've got two more uh, times, two more lessons in the book of Proverbs. This week we are studying justice. Next week we are studying work. And then on from there we'll get into the book of Hebrews, which we're, we're going to be kicking off this fall and uh, staying in for the, the, uh, the, month, the remaining months of the fall and into the spring. I'm really excited about our study in the book of Hebrews. But for now, go to uh, the book of Proverbs. If you're in a pew Bible that's between pages 530 and 540, we're going to be going back and forth to various passages there. But let me begin by reading actually from the book of Matthew. You stay in Proverbs and just listen to these words from our Lord in the book of Matthew. This is from Matthew chapter 25. Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on his glorious throne, and before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats he will place on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry And you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for you, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So these are the words of our Lord toward the end of his time on earth and toward the end of his uh, ministry, discipling and training his disciples. He's talking to believers here. He's talking to these men whom he's been walking along through life for a few years now. And, he, and he's putting in them, these, he's compelling them to have a mind for other people. And when we read passages like this, it is, we read this and we think, this, I mean, this, this, it's terribly convicting in a wonderful way. And we, we, know, we know this is to be true. We know this to be true, that, that there is need in the world, that there is unjust action in the world that needs to be addressed. And we have the capacity to meet some of that need and to undo some of the injustice. And, and Jesus raises the stakes here and says, this, these are the actions, basically, these are the actions of those who claim to follow me. This is what their life would be characterized by. Some, some of these types of, this type of generosity and this type of justice would be uh, characteristic of the lives of those who claim to know God and certainly of those who will be entering into the kingdom of heaven. This is not prerequisite this is not the path of salvation, right? You don't, you don't do good things to other people in order to be saved. He's not saying that. But he's saying, for those who are saved, this is the kind of life that you live. One of the most difficult questions that we tend to wrestle with, and, it, and it, it's in our face a lot these days, is what do we as Christ followers, where is our, what is our part to play in the insufficiency of the world? What is our part to play in the injustice that we see in the world around us? Tim Keller, as he writes on the book of Proverbs, he says, our social systems quarantine the poor. We protect ourselves from the impositions that their needs would bring upon us. We force them to live all together so that the poor have no neighbors, 
with the resources and the connections to be kind to them. And this, of course, only deepens their poverty. Whole neighborhoods and communities of the poor lack what is called social capital, the informal networks of friends and colleagues who trust one another and share goodwill and assets by making referrals, offering free advice, opening doors, entering into partnerships with one another. Again, we see that to turn our backs on the poor of our municipalities, avoiding them and maintaining their isolation is not just being uncharitable. It is, in fact, a sin. But then when you, when you think of these statements, and I, I would say, yeah, that's, it's compelling, it's true. And he's, he's writing, just, he's, he's writing by, based off of Proverbs 14.20. Where do we start? The need is huge. It's, it seems insurmountable, right? It is insurmountable. Jesus even said, the poor will always be among you. So what's my part to play? If I give it all away right now, I'll have nothing left to give tomorrow. So do, how, how do I balance this? How do I... Walk wisely and address the needs of the world around me. Address the needs of the poor and the needy around me. Here's the good news. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, walks this so wonderfully, so wisely. And of course, the, the goal of the book of Proverbs is to give you and to train you in wisdom and to help you think wisely and discerningly. And so we're going to have the opportunity to do that today. And let me just say from the outset we're going to be talking about justice, and I want, for, the, for our younger generation, I want you to hear this. We're going to be talking about terms and talking in terms that, for the majority of this, is going to, to make you think of what our world refers to as social justice. But listen to me. In the Bible's terms, there is no such thing and here's what I mean by this. There is no adjective necessary for justice. Right? You don't put adjectives in front of that word. Justice is justice. What our, what our world is saying is, and I, and I can appreciate the heart behind it is, there are things that are happening, systemic wrong, systemic brokenness, that is affecting us on a social level, in our economics, in our school systems, in our relationships, in the way our towns are built, our cities are built, that have to do with the, the social and, or the societal factor of life, the societal sector of life. And, and as a result, we're trying to focus, we're trying to narrow the, the, the broad focus of justice to that specific area and to exercise justice there. And if that's the case, if, if that's your understanding, I get it, I, under, I can empathize with that. I think there's, there's some right there. I'm not saying that this is a wrong idea. But you need to be careful because we'll often talk in terms that I think muddy the, the, the definitions. When the Bible talks about justice, it talks about justice. Knowing what is right and then doing it. Seeing a need and then meeting it when it is appropriate and right to do so. And exercising discernment along the way. The Bible doesn't talk in terms of social justice or economic justice or any other kind of, it's just justice. So I want, I want to be careful because we're going to be talking about um, that realm of what, what our world would refer to as social justice. It's just in a way that the world doesn't see it. And so I, if we don't define our terms early in the game, then uh, we may not, there may be some confusion later. Justice needs no adjectives. So we're going to talk today we're going to see today in the book of Proverbs the need for justice, the way of justice, and the way to become just, one who exercises justice in the world around you. So let's begin with number one, the need for justice. Number one, the need for justice. If you look at Proverbs 29, verse 7, Proverbs 29, verse 7 says, A righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. A righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. Now this word, knows, it's kind of a fascinating word in the Hebrew language, and it's, it's used quite, uh, it's used a lot in the Old Testament, but the word 
it, it's often used for a specific type of knowledge, and it's, it's almost uncomfortable. So let me just get right here. It barely, this word barely even comes close to, the, to its full meaning in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew word here is the word yada. It's the most deep and intimate and experiential word in the Hebrew language for knowledge. If you read the first chapters of Genesis, for instance, you will see that Adam knew his wife. And as a result, they had babies. That's, that's, the, that's the kind of knowledge that is happening here in, in Proverbs. Cain knew his wife, and then they had children, right? So the pro- proverb, this proverb is saying someone who is righteous knows, yada, they know, they're deeply and passionately and intensely aware of the rights of the poor, the just treatment of the poor. That's why some other translations would say the, the righteous person cares for the justice of the poor. But, but why? Why should we know the rights? Why should we care? Why? They're not in, like, you know, especially if, if somebody's living in another town, if somebody's down the street from me, they're not in my family, they're not in my household, they're not part of my tribe, my clan, my, my people, right? I don't, I may not, I may never even have any kind of any reason where my path with them would ever cross. Why should I care about the rights or the, the needs of somebody else who's down the street? What link, what connection is the Bible making between personal righteousness and other people's justice? Proverbs 21.3 says, To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So this is something that we, as Christ followers, we have to take this seriously. The first step toward understanding the why is understanding the what. So let's look. What it is, what justice is, is bringing the world back to rights. Bringing the world back to rights. And I'm borrowing language here from N.T. Wright in his book, Evil and the Justice of God. In fact, I would recommend to you, just right here, I'm going to recommend to you another book, uh, Timothy Keller's book, Generous Justice, is a wonderful treatment, and he actually spends a good amount of time in the book of Proverbs as he's studying the topic of justice uh, as we see it in Scripture. But, uh, and, and Hilton, I have to say this also. Let me just give this caveat in the beginning here. Of all of the topics that we study in the book of Proverbs, this is the one that I've been punting the most. So we've, we, I had this thought that I, that I would preach this back in, I think, May or June. And as we came closer to it, I realized I'm not ready to study this. I, I, can, I can talk about pride, because I know my pride. I could talk about envy. I've searched my heart on that matter. I could talk about, you know, we could talk about the, even the pursuit of wisdom or diligence or la- laziness, other things. But this is one that I, I just, I haven't really grappled with well. So I just kept bumping it back further and further into the summer. And so here we are. This is, the, this is my last shot because next week is Labor Day. I want to preach on work on Labor Day weekend. So uh, I, I, I do not claim any uh, mastery over this subject. I'm very much, I was learning a lot this week. And I would commend to you some other great minds and, and greater minds, greater, great writers uh, who have talked a lot about and worked a lot on this subject. But... Um, but this is just a, this, what we're talking about here at the beginning here, what it is, it's bringing the world back to rights. One of the things that I learned is from these passages that are on the board behind me, Proverbs 22, verse 8, Proverbs 21, 7, is some of the definitions of justice as we see it talked about in the book of Proverbs. The, the definitions themselves are actually helpful for under, help, helping, helping us understanding uh, what it is that we talk about when we talk about justice. Proverbs 22, let me actually start with verse 7, says, The rich ruler, I'm sorry, the rich rules over the poor. The borrower's slave to the lender. Whoever sows injustice, or in the Hebrew, what is not just, will reap calamity, and the rod of his fury will fail. Proverbs 21, 7 says, The violence of the wicked will sweep them away because they refuse to do what is just. Now, these passages definitely highlight the need for justice, but you can actually learn something about what justice is just from uh, the definitions here, the, the words that are used here to refer to justice. In verse 20, chapter 22, verse 8, the word for justice, whoever sows what is not just, is 
tzedakah. It's this Hebrew word that means proactive justice, right? Giving every person fair and equal treatment, doing what is right by them. And here, here's one of the things that you need to understand. When the Bible talks about justice for the needy and justice for the poor, it's not saying, it's never saying, treat them more favorably than you would treat somebody else. It's saying, do what you would do for anybody else, same to them. So if they are, if they are right and, and they're being exploited, if they have rights that are being exploited, you defend them. You speak up for them because they don't have the voice or the means or the finances to do it themselves. You take their case. If, on the other hand, they are wrong, if they have committed crime, if they have done something that's been self-destructive or otherwise destructive, you don't defend them. You help correct them. But you do it in a way that understands the dynamic that's at play there and the, the lack and the need that they have. So there's this idea of proactive justice. That is right here in verse 8, chapter 22. And then chapter 21, verse 7. The word for justice, what is right, is mishpat. Mishpat means reactive justice, where you see something that's wrong and you take up the banner to, you take up the, the, the opportunity to fix it, to do something right and to make things right, to make things right for those who are being exploited. So the first is proactive, the second is reactive. If everyone was living proactive justice in our world and doing the right things and treating people fairly, then the reactive justice wouldn't be necessary. But the book of Proverbs is saying it is necessary because there isn't proactive justice where there ought to be. People aren't being treated fairly. I was just reminded of this last night. Uh, two of our guys, we were at the Gun at the range, uh, at the skeet and meet last night, shooting clays. Some of the guys were chatting about job transitions, and, and you know, one saying, "I was let go, and it was not. It was not just. Somebody did something really sneaky where they changed the wording of this document. This uh, not even a contract, and so it ended up having me lose months of severance that I was that I was earlier owed." That's unjust. And now he has to take, take steps to try to undo what was done to him. Right? And so uh, there is this reactive justice that is necessary in the world. It's to make, to bring the world back to rights, to undo the wrong in the world. And this is so close to God's heart. Zechariah chapter 7, the Lord says, the, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true justice, he says. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let no one of you devise evil against another in your heart. But, Zechariah says, they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. So Israel wasn't just guilty of doing evil to the needy. They were actually guilty of not doing anything to stop the evil against the needy. So we're talking about bringing the world back to rights. Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it, to make things right. Now, now one of the illustrations that was really helpful for me this past week as I was reading Tim Keller's book, Generous Justice, as he's going through some of these Proverbs, he likens, he says one of the ideas that's behind justice in almost every passage, almost every treatment of justice in Scripture is this idea, this very deep, very rich, very biblical idea of shalom. And shalom, when we think of shalom, we typically think of the word peace. But shalom in Scripture is much more than just this outward peace. It would be, and I want to use the word carefully, but a holistic peace. Where it's, because in the, in the scripture, when it, we, they would talk about shalom, peace, they would talk about peace in your relationships, peace in your inner being. They, they would, shalom would be referring to your physical health. It would be referring to your finances. It would be referring to your family dynamics, referring to your community. That's, the biblical idea of shalom is it, it intersects all 
different realms of your world and in, in your life. And so Tim Keller talks about it. He says, uh, one of the images that God regularly uses throughout Scripture when he's talking about shalom, this idea of, of the, the wholeness and the interwovenness and the health of the human existence, the, the metaphor that he uses a lot is that of fabric. And so you see, the, as God talking about his creation, when he talks about the seas in Psalm 104, that's, he talks about the fabric of the sea, the fabric of the clouds in Job 38, the fabric of the lights of the sky, like a, like a garment that's being stretched out in Psalm 104. And all the forces of nature in Psalm 102 are like garments that God has woven and, and now wears. And he says, in a sense, creation, when it's existing as it ought to exist, which it hasn't because of our brokenness, because of our sinfulness, it's, it's like this interwoven fabric. And a fabric, if you know, I mean, if, if I were to just stretch out a thousand threads right here, if I had them bundled in my hand and just threw them out on the floor right here, you would know that, I mean, you could, you could have thousands of threads right here, but if somebody else were to pick up the other end and we were to stre- stretch it tight and you were to put a, a bowling ball on that lump of threads, it would just fall right through, right? Because there's, no, there's, there's not enough strength there and they're not connected. There's no connectivity to actually hold that thing together. But, if you, but when you think of a fabric, Every thread is woven together over, under, around, and through. And beca- it's not so much the structure that's focused on as it is the relationships that is focused on. And then all of those threads all together become something strong and healthy and good. And that's the kind of image that the Bible regularly uses to refer to this kind of shalom peace that is, is the goal of justice in the world. So usually when we think of justice, we think of it like this. We think of, we think of like this, this group over here, and we think of, that, of somebody being freed from that group, to, be, like to finally be unoppressed, to finally be, to be freed from the system, not under the heavy yoke of somebody else, right? So when we think of justice, we, we think of autonomy, in a sense. Um, when, when the Bible talks about justice, it's much different. The Bible talks about justice... We, it talks about the, the healthy whole, the community. And when somebody is being oppressed and ostracized, they need to be brought in. They need to be made whole. They need to be healed by being connected and part of the interwoven fabric of the God-fearing community. That's, that's what we're aiming for. That's the, the ideal of justice. Now, so that's what it is. Why it's needed B, why it's needed, our world is broken. There's, and this is the obvious part, right? So we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this. But Proverbs 13, 23 says, The fallow ground of the poor would yield much fruit, but it is swept away through injustice. So do you see what it's saying? It's saying, the, the, what is fallow ground? Fallow ground is a field that hasn't even been plowed. It hasn't even been planted, right? It hasn't been paid attention to at all. But this field is so fertile that is producing food without even being tilled or planted. Proverbs is saying that the poor might even be able to live off of the little that they have. But what happens in our world, oftentimes the poor, I mean, they might even have a decent asset in their own corner that they could, that they could you know, survive off of. But there are times when injustice sweeps in and takes what little they have. That could be an unjust person. The Bible even says that could be an unjust system, like a government, because justice is often heavily uh, relied upon the government for in, in, and the, the government rulers in the book of Proverbs who are called to be just. There are a lot of people who would want to point at the failure of our systems, our government, our politics, our greedy economy, our unequally resourced schools or whatever it is, and there is some truth there. And there are a lot of people, a lot of others, who would want to point at laziness, personal laziness or a lack of initiative, or the breakdown of the family, or a series of poor decisions, or dependence on substances. And, and, and there is definitely truth there. The Bible and its wisdom says yes to all of that. It is complex. And it is, it, it's the system and, our, and the personal, and our, and our very personal being. We are, we're broken and we are creating brokenness. And so we need to address it. And the Bible says it, it, it's, it's that complex and it's maybe even more complex than that because it keeps us, it recognizes that the human heart and the 
and what comes out of the human heart affects the justice in the world around us. So when we look at it, when we look at justice in these terms, it keeps us humble. It keeps us from condescending upon people. It keeps us from assuming the worst of people in different situations from us. It also keeps us from assuming the best unwittingly or naively, assuming the best of others around us. Proverbs pushes us to be wise and discerning. So let's look at C, who it's about. Proverbs, this is fascinating to me, Proverbs very consistently says it's about the Creator and His creatures. Proverbs 17.5 says, Whoever mocks the poor insults his Maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Proverbs 14.31 says, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his Maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. What's interesting to me is that when we studied the law in Exodus last year, there was a lot about treating the poor. There was a lot about going out of your way to, to exercise justice for the poor and the needy, to, to be kind to the sojourner and to, to, to pull in those who are wanderers and those who are foreigners. And every single time in the book of Exodus, and you see it again in the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, every single time you see a, a commandment that is given about the needy or the sojourner, the foreigner, the widow, every single time the reminder is you were once like them. And you were saved out of Egypt. You were wandering in the desert. You were out on your own, and I brought you in. So now you bring others in. What's unique here is that not once in Proverbs does he refer to the Exodus. Every single time in Proverbs he talks about creation or the creation order. God is the creator of us all. We share one common creator. We share one common humanity. If we mock the poor, we mock God. If we love the poor, we love God. So justice is very much connected to our creator, God himself. He is a just and holy. He is loving and caring, and he lives those things out, not exercising mercy in spite of his justice, not loving in spite of his holiness, but but all of those things, all faithful all at once. And he created us, you and I, to be and to do the same. And that's why we need this wisdom. That's why we need this discernment. Now, just as a sidebar, if you're, if you're in the room this morning and you're not a believer, if you're in the room and you, maybe if you were dragged here by a friend or if, you were just, if you're just visiting and you're exploring the ideas or the claims of Christianity, think about this. Without God and without some system of morality, there is no, justice has no grounds, right? Because if you, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe that there is a reason, that there is some um, exterior motive for us to think rightly or to do rightly of somebody else, or for somebody else, then you have to admit it's got to be the survival of the fittest, right? And so if, if you look at our world, and if you would apply a, a secular worldview to the, the realm of justice, as just as you would to the rest of the world around us, you would say certain people in our culture are not, certain people in our society are not fit to survive. Certain families ought to end. So I'm not gonna, we're not going to pay attention. We should swallow them up. And that's brutal. But that's, that's your worldview. If you really, if you, unless, unless, you would say, no, there's got to be some morality that is higher than us, that we live up to, and that we're called up to. And Christianity would say, yeah, that's, what, that's because we are creatures who have been created, and there's a design, and there's an order, there's a fabric to the universe, and we're a part of that. So, so that's the need for justice. Let's talk about the way of justice. This is the second half of uh, what we want to get into here, the way of justice. So let's fr- talk first about ownership. The, the, one of the ways that you're going to see justice lived out and talked about in the book of Proverbs is this idea of ownership, that there would be some ownership of the problem itself and some ownership even of the person who is the problem themselves. And this is going to get, I'm going to, I'm, we're going to step on some toes here, I think. So, but just listen carefully. Proverbs 3, 27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, 
when it is in your power to do it. It's, it would be one thing to interpret this, to look at this passage and say, okay, if there's, if there's a need and or if there's something wrong that is happening and I have the power to stop it, I am to or I ought to step up and do something about it. The word good here, I learned this, way, this week from Bruce Walkie is a great Old Testament scholar, has done a lot of work. Uh, in Old Testament language. He, and he points out that this word, good, in this passage means material goods as well as right. So he's saying, do not withhold even, even actual goods from those to whom it is due. And think about what he's saying there when he says, to whom it is due. This, this phrase, to whom it is due, is a single Hebrew word that means the owners of that thing. He's saying, you have it. Think about, think about this. This is going to bother some of us. You have a thing. You have money. You have time. You have resources. You have it in your possession, right? It's in your house right now, that thing, whatever it is. And Proverbs is saying, there's somebody else in the world to whom that thing in your house is due. That, that really bothers a, a lot of us. That, that, and that kind of undoes me when I think about it. And when he says, when it, is in, when it is in your power to do it, is the beautiful qualifier where he says, when, when you have the opportunity, when you, have, when you see the need, when you have that, when, you, when you've got the relationship or you've got the resources, you've got the connection, and you know I can meet this need, Proverbs ups the bar and says, there is an ownership that is, that is at stake here. There's an ownership that's to play here. It's not so easy as to say, well, this is my stuff. It's not theirs. I don't owe them my stuff. When it says, to whom it is due, that's owning language. Who owes whom? The one who has, the one who has the ability to do good, the one who has the power, it says, to do it. So in negative terms, so they have, they have rights on us in a sense. In negative terms, they have the right not to be mistreated, not to be defrauded, not to be oppressed. In positive terms, they have the right to be treated with fairness, to be treated with respect, and to be helped when we see the room for help, when we see the need for help. Tim Keller, again, when he was writing about this topic, he writes, the world is God's. And if he has given you more of it to steward than someone else, that does not mean that it belongs wholly to you. Like any steward, you must use the true owner's wealth as he wishes it to be used. God loves everything he has made, Psalm 145, and especially those who fall and are bowed down, Psalm 145, 14. To quote Basil the Great, the bread which you keep belongs to the hungry, the coats in your closet to the naked, those shoes to the shoeless, the gold you have hidden to the needy. Therefore, as often as you were able to help others and refused, so often did you do them wrong. Now again, those are, like, those are heavy statements. Those are heavy and convicting thoughts. But Proverbs it consistently backs this up. Proverbs 21, 13, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. So, so let me ask you, are there, are there people that you know of in your spheres of life where you know need, where you've seen need and have chosen to turn a blind eye and to not address it, to not do anything about it? Has the Lord given you something of his temporarily on these few years that you have on this earth to do something about the needs of others in the world around you? as you steward those things. Let's move on. So the first thing that's needed is ownership. The second thing that's needed is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Let me read another passage. It's not going to be on the board behind us, but Proverbs 24, verse 10 and following says, 
If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will not he repay man according to his work? Basically, there, there's always a cost to doing justice. Always a cost. It either costs time or money or reputation or whatever it is. There's always a cost. So, so one of the questions that we're confronted with is, do I think, do I really believe that what I give, what I sacrifice, what I relinquish of my own and give in grace and goodness toward others, is God good enough? Is he capable enough to make good on his promise and his word to repay me what I've given to somebody else? In a way, it's a, it's a challenge. What you, how you respond in moments where you see need and do or don't respond, do or don't give, it's a reflection of what you believe about God and his goodness toward you and his faithfulness toward you. During World War II, many German, French, and Dutch families saw their Jewish neighbors being dragged away and led to death and slaughter. And a lot of them afterward claimed, like, listen, we didn't even know anything was going on. We didn't know anything about this, right? And they were guilty because they didn't want to know. A lot of them knew. They had suspected. I mean, obviously, a bunch of people were being, they were disappearing. They just didn't, they didn't want to know the details. And so they turned a blind eye for fear of what it might cost them. Right? Viktor Frankl, who survived the Nazi death camps, described how many moral upstanding citizens turned into collaborators with the enemy in order to survive. These situations, he said, can re reveal deep selfishness in our hearts that we otherwise keep hidden. He says, the true test of a person's strength or mettle is adversity. Almost anyone can survive the good times. But the true test is adversity. So, so we, we recognize it's, it's going to cost. There's going to be sacrifice. And so I, I would ask you, how? How can you, what can you sacrifice? How can you sacrifice? What can you speak up? How can you speak up for others? And what can you do for others? Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. So ownership, sacrifice, Discretion, number three, discretion, or letter C. Proverbs 17, 18 says, The one who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Let me read that one more time, a little more slowly. One who lacks sense, in other words, one, you're, you're a fool, right? Gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. In other words, you're a fool. You lack sense if you financially bind yourself to somebody that you know isn't good for it. What this is saying is generosity is good, but generosity does not just blind you to proper caution and discretion and discernment, right? You don't just go away, just go, go giving money away. You don't just pick any random person or any community and just start just pumping resources into that. You need to be careful. You need to be intentional. And it's possible to help in a way that actually hurts. It's possible to increase dependency and not to, to decrease that dependency and actually increase autonomy and, and responsibility. It's possible to enable bad habits, and so if somebody needs, if somebody comes to you in need of money, you need to do your homework and figure out, are they in a healthy place to receive this money? Or are they going to exploit it? Are they going to become dependent on me or dependent on, on us as a church or, or, or my organization? You don't, want to just, you don't want to just give blindly. You don't want to do that. So you need to exercise discretion and wisdom and discernment. I love this one quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, we are not simply to bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. And that's kind of, there's, there's two sides to this. On one hand, you could say, it's, it's like saying, um, David Crowder, I was at a David Crowder band concert not long ago, and he's, and, or years ago, I should say, but he, he said in, his, in, the, in the middle of his concert, he said, you know, it's one thing to pull people out of a frozen river because they're, they're crying for help. It's something else to go up river and stop the person who's throwing them in. Right? And so, so there's, there's a degree to which we want to get to the heart of the problem and actually stop the heart of it, right? And that's, that's kind of what Bonhoeffer's getting at here, too. Sometimes the person themselves is the problem. 
And so we have to exercise discernment. We have to exercise wisdom. And we have to get, we want as much as we can to get to the root of the problem and not just address the symptoms of it. It's, we don't want to be enabling. We don't want to be assuming. assuming. Right? So ownership, sacrifice, discretion. The, the fourth one I would just simply say is action. But I'm, I didn't put that on the screen up here. We need to take action. All of these things together result in action. Now, let's talk about the way to become just. I mean, so anybody, anybody feeling guilty right now? <laughs> like, I'm, like, when you read these passages, it seems it's so heavy, right? There's so much. And, we, and we, when you look around the world, we, we think about our own neighborhoods. Or we think about the neighborhoods nearby. We feel like, man, there's just there's so much to be done. There's so much need. Where do you even start? I, have, I don't have the resources, right? I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out for my family in this year, how do, I, how do I manage this and that? How do I make these decisions? How do I finance my own family and keep us floating? How, do, how on earth are you going to take on a project of a, in a completely other family or another community? What, what could you possibly do? Some of us, when we read these passages, we get overwhelmed. And I have a few friends in my life who are deeply passionate about matters of justice and social reform. And do you know that the number one tool that people use to promote, to get others to act? Any guesses what it is? Guilt. I, I, I can't, I love my friends, but they guilt me a lot, even as a pastor. You, should be, you need to be preaching about this. There's so much wrong in the world. You need to be preaching about this more, and, and you could be doing something about this yourself, and this is, you know, here are all these needs, and they're quoting statistics and showing me maps and, like, giving me graphs and sending me links on the internet from the internet. Constantly putting out need and con constantly using guilt as a motivator. And I'll tell you, it, you cannot, if that's, if that's you right now, put your guilt away. As, hard, as difficult and as, almost as heartless as that sounds, it's not heartless. And this is why. Guilt puts pressure on you from the outside, right, without changing you on the inside. Guilt never makes someone passionate about doing justice for others. Guilt will make you passionate about satiating your guilt. And you'll do things for other people to make you feel better about yourself, to feel like you're doing something for other people. So don't go the route of feeling guilty or making other people feel guilty for doing or not doing more in the community. What I love about the book of Proverbs is that it, it doesn't use, I mean, yeah, it says this is it. This is like, this is what's right. But it doesn't lambast people and layer and layer and layer people with guilt. So how, how are you going to go about changing from the inside? Proverbs 22 verse 2 talks about or implies this empathy, right? So the way to become just first is empathy. See yourself in them. See the common ground that you have in them. Proverbs 22.2 says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. And what I love about this is the language actually is the, the rich and the poor, literally, it's, literally says they have this in common. We are all on the same ground here. One of the passages, uh, and I can't recall it to mind, I'm sorry, was um, where, where God is talking to Israel. And he says, why, in the book of Isaiah, he says, why do you treat Israel? your flesh and blood like this. And then in the next verse he says, the sojourner, the, you know, like the alien, the widow and the needy. In other words, he's saying this, this sojourner, this foreigner who's from not Israel, why do you treat your flesh and blood, them, this foreigner, flesh and blood, why do you treat them inappropriately? And in that moment, God's saying, you think it's all about your tribe. You think it's all about your family. You think it's all about you and your household and your household income. He says, you need to think bigger. Your blood and flesh encompasses way more than what your, what your culture tells you. And you have, to have, you have to start with a heart of empathy. How would you know, when we go back to that first passage that we're talking about, that the righteous know the needs of the poor. The righteous know the just needs, the rights of the poor. How would you know poverty so intimately? This is where the Christian 
has the only corner on this. Only someone who has come face to face with their own neediness. Only someone who has come face to face with God's sovereign grace. Only someone who has come face to face with God's holiness and the gap between our great God and our stupid selves, our sinful selves. Only somebody who is aware of that, who has seen God reach into that, who has seen God mend that gap themselves and and has received God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's help and God's love and God's mercy. Only somebody who has been met with that, who only somebody who's, who's had that exchange can say, I don't, I don't deserve what I have, right? I, and, I, and, and what I have is temporary. I've just been entrusted with this as a steward. If it weren't for God's sovereign grace, I could very well have been born in, in Zambia to, or to another family or in another economy and not have the means that I have. Only somebody who has truly wrestled with, wrestled with their own poverty and their own undeservedness, has the compassion not just to be sympathetic, but truly empathetic. And they can say, yeah, I get it. I know something of, of poverty. I can relate. I'm just like you. So, empathy is one of the first things that we need. Second is dignity, to see God's image in them. And if I, again, if I could borrow back from the same language, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. He's ta- this is creation language that he's talking about. Recognizing their, the goodness that is placed in them because of the image of God that is upon them. Let me, let me move on to the last point and wrap up with this. Incarnation is the last point. That we see how God became poor. One of the things that Proverbs leaves us hanging with is that Proverbs will paint this problem. And Proverbs will... will, will Answer by, by talking about us relating to the poor, loving the poor, caring for the poor because of God our creator. But the writers of Proverbs didn't yet know that the creator became part of his creation. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. The beauty of the gospel is that our God, who is perfectly holy, perfectly just, and unlike any of us, deserved to be treated that way, became one who was mistreated and treated unjustly, who was tried unjustly. He, and, and, and he did it in poverty, right? He was born in a barn. He was laid in a trough. He never owned a home, never owned a, owned a horse. He had to borrow a donkey to ride into the city. He had to borrow a room to have his last meal. Never owned a thing. He even said, son of man goes about living, you know, like just, just like foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He became poor so that he could make you rich in him. So that those of us who recognize our poverty, those of us who recognize, I don't deserve this. When we recognize that, and in in faith, reach out to the Lord for forgiveness and for a relationship with him, and place our faith in him, we get his richness, and we get his justice. And that in turn, when we see what what that's done for us, that overwhelms our hearts, and frees us finally to be just toward others and to be generous toward others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Will you pray with me? Father, these passages, man, they are, they, they are heavy. They, it seems so daunting to think about such a task as caring for the needs of the world. But Lord, we praise you because you you have done it and you have freed us from from the, the guilt of feeling like we could never do it. You give us the opportunity instead to respond in grace because of what you've already done for us and what you've already given to us. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful and begin with just one. Just find one area, one avenue, one person 
that we can be faithful to, that we can make a difference for. And would we start there, Lord, with just, just one? Give us wisdom, give us discernment, give us compassion, give us empathy as we seek to live justly in your world. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.